Time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Edmund O'Brien in another of the adventures of the man with an action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. Expense account. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Intercontinental Marine Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditure during my assignment aboard the SS Malay Trader, the ship with no port of call. <laughs> Expense account, item one, $80. Transportation from Hartford to Savannah, Georgia, where, after pausing only to grow a beard and deck myself out in seaman's garb, I proceeded to the local hiring hall of the Seaman's Union. on the melee trader. Ordinary seaman, special permit. Special, huh? Well, let me see now. Oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. Insurance deck, huh? Well, I'm glad to cooperate, daughter. Thanks. Where do I find the ship? Pier 8. The directions will all be here on your assignment slip. Uh, what's the beef? A hot cargo? Oh, maybe. When I find out, you can read about it in the paper. Okay, so you're not talking. That's your business. Here's your slip. Now, um... The best way to get there is to follow the railroad tracks past the warehouse. It's right across the street. My new home, when I found her, looked neither pretentious, comfortable, or even seaworthy. She was a rusty old Liberty ship that probably had a war record, but hadn't had a coat of paint in months. Her winches fore and aft were busy feeding heavy rattan-covered bales into her gaping holes. Her decks were alive with longshoremen, and set against all that activity, a bulky gent wearing an officer's cap lolled on a stool near the head of the gangway, idling time with fingernails and a penknife. Yeah? What's your business? I'm signing on. Where do I find the chief officer? You found him. I'm all set. Let me see you slip. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, Dollar. You're on the, uh, 48 watch. Quarters of 3A. Just past the galley, then half starboard side. Go down to your dear. You can sign later. Right. So far, the spy story method seemed to be working. I was aboard the ship as a seaman, and a few seconds later... I was shaking hands with a man who shared my quarters, Al Rhoda, on a salary for four years as Intercontinental's Marine Investigator. Johnny. Hi, Al. Hey, it's been a long time. How are you? I'm fine, fine. It's good to be working a case with you again. Hey, you, uh, is it all right to talk in here? Yeah, yeah, but let's keep it down. I've been on this tub since it left Singapore, and nobody's on to me yet. But play it cagey on deck. How much did they tell you in jolly old Hartford? Well, they gave me just the basic situation, that uh, that Intercontinental insured a bunch of crude rubber from British Malays before the devaluation of the British pound sterling. Half that, I understand, burned in a warehouse in Singapore. I bet, to the tune of over 100,000 insurance bucks. I flew out there. Signs of arson, but no proof. I followed the other half of the crop here to Savannah. Hey, uh, this company that owns it, Malay Traders... Kind of an outfit, is it? They aren't angels. Been up against British customs a few times. Never nailed. They own their ships, and the branch here, headed by a Mr. Peeler, imports basic commodities, like the rubber and minerals. Mm -hmm. Well, the point is that since this crude was insured before the British pound dropped, they can bring in more loot destroying it than they can selling it. Yeah, I guess that totals. 
And I take it the policy covers until they do so, huh? That's it. I thought we were getting rid of it here. They packed it away in their warehouse. But then three days ago, they started loading it aboard again. That's why you were sent down. What's the matter, Al? Don't you think the company trusts you? <laughs> uh, I guess they figure I need help. And they're right. Where do you think we're bound, Johnny? Well, my paper's at Corpus Christi. The scuttlebutt is that Corpus is just a stop. That we clear there for Mexico, Veracruz, where arson investigation isn't what it could be. After that operation in Singapore, what else would they Hold be... It. Lo- Hold it. Dollar, are you in there? Yeah. Hold oh, stop. Ship's articles are in the company office, corner of the warehouse. Go ashore and sign them. Yeah, okay, right away. Uh, sir... Nice try, sailor. Oh, and uh, if you'll take a word of fatherly advice... Well, practically anything you say. Go ahead. That uh, that girl in the office, the Malayan half-caste, she's the boss's daughter. Ah, my. Ah, my. Is that for appreciation, or is it her name? Both. But save your dreams. The chief, our friend Hallstaff, is as possessive as he's big. And you know something? I don't blame him. I didn't blame Holstaff either, after I saw our ride. You could tell she had enough Occidental know-how to be proud of what the Oriental did to her looks. Ah, my, indeed. Good afternoon. Hello. I'm here to sign the articles. I'm the Malay trader. Oh, uh, what, please, your name? Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Dollar. Are you a very thrifty man, Mr. Dollar? Well, Hardly. My name is usually the only one I have to my name. Uh, your signature right here. Oh, I wish I were sailing with you. What? What did you say? That I wish I were sailing with you. I have begged with my father. But he will not let me go with him. Oh. Your father's going with us, huh? I didn't know that. I will beg some more. Uh, once again, please, your name right here. Oh. You have nice hands, Mr. Dollar. Nice hands? Now, why'd you say that? I see so many hands here on my desk, so I notice them. Some are big and lumpy. Some are short, some are dirty. And in steward's department, some are clean from dishwashing, but all really. I see. Well, I'd better get back to the ship, thanks. Thank you. We hope that conditions during your voyage will meet with your approval and that you will accept employment with melee traders again. And with those memorized words ringing in my ear, I thanked the luscious Amai again and proceeded shipward to take up my duties as a very ordinary seaman. I hoped that her interest in my landlubber hands really stemmed from her unusual hobby and not from suspicion. And I wondered why Mr. Peeler, her father, and the local head of the suspect company had decided to go with us. Had his doctor ordered a sea voyage for his health? Or did he want to enjoy in person the odor of burning rubber? The next afternoon, the cargo had all been brought aboard. The ship was made ready for sea. And I had sustained, along with multiple cuts and bruises, the ire of the boatman because I didn't know the difference between a preventer and a topping lift. But by the time night fell and the melee trader was plunging down the Atlantic coast, I knew one thing. The sailor's life is not for me. How'd you make out, Al? Well, nothing new. Little butt is still Vera Cruz, but there's something screwy about it, Johnny. You develop a nose after you've snooped as many ships as I have. There's something wrong aboard. What? Uh, Besides my seamanship. The old man? Yeah, a lot of little things. Of course, we're on for Florida Straits. The readings on the ballast gauges. Of course, the displacement ratio changes with different oceans and water temperatures. Look, look, Al. That's that's all Greek to me. Ballast gauges, displacement ratio. Just what are these things that are bothering you? Well, I don't know. Just... Vague things that... 
Look, come out on the foredeck with me, will you? Yeah, sure. Probably just this overactive nose of mine, but... I want to get a look in one of these holes. Now, there's a hand standing lookout in the bow. And if you'll go up there and keep his attention, I'll slip into the escape hatch of number two. All I'll need is about ten minutes. I'll meet you in the cabin. I made small talk with the lookout for ten minutes, then started back towards the cabin. Suddenly, I heard a scuffle behind me. Hey, Al, is that you? Then I heard someone running, and I started after the disappearing figure. But I didn't get very far. I stumbled over Al Rover's body by the open hatch. And there was a stab wound in the back of his neck, just at the top of his spine. It was small enough to have been left there by a penknife. I didn't report to the chief mate or the captain. I went over both their heads, and I pounded on the door of the owner, Mr. Peter. Mr. Peter! Yes, yes, yes. One moment. Uh, what is this? Uh, what does this mean? There's been a killing down on deck. What? Uh, what do you say? Killing? My watchmate, Al Rhoda. But this I will not believe. The captain or Mr. Hulkstaff, where are they? Why do you come to me? Because, because I think a request from you is an order. I think Sparks ought to radio the Coast Guard. The sooner the better. But the killing on my ship... To believe this from you. No, no, I do not. What is that? Man overboard, Mr. Peeler. A murder has just been turned into an accident. In just a moment, we return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, Kitty Callan will join Vaughn Monroe's caravan along most of these same CBS stations this Saturday night. And on the CBS Gene Autry show, the King of the Cowboys will bring you Ramona, When the Bloom is on the Sage, and many another Western favorite. The Vaughn Monroe caravan and the Gene Autry show are heard every Saturday night. Hear them tomorrow night in an hour of Top Pops and Sagebrush Symphonies. Now, with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Mr. Horsas. Mr. Horsas. Please come here, Mr. Horsas. Yes, sir. Mr. Hosta, there has been trouble? Yes, sir. One of the crew fell overboard, sir. Uh, then talk with this young man. Uh, he speaks of killing. Killing? Now, it's you, Dollar. What's this guff about killing? Al Rhoda was stabbed in the back of the neck with a small knife. This man is either drunk or crazy, Mr. Peeler. Yes, Mr. Denis. I just stepped out on deck to check the running lights before I turned in. I saw the man leaning over the rail. He was sick. The ship rolled and he went over. Have it your way. I guess that was a life jacket I stumbled over, huh? Well, what are you doing about the man overboard? I'll thank you to remember your place on the ship. I do, but I also remember Al Rhoda. Doing what's prescribed by maritime law. I'm changing my course to circle and search the area. Yeah, how about the Coast Guard? They'll be notified in due time. I'll either go to your quarters or get forward with the rest of the crew and look for this guy you're so worried about. Where are you going? The radio room. Even I know the Coast Guard gets first bid. You listen to me, Dollar. I'll have you up before a commission board. You'll never ship again if you don't obey my order. <laughs> hey, the boilers. You better get to your lifeboat station, Mr. Peeler. Every time an explosion lifted the melee trader up off the water, it lifted my stomach up with it. My heart must have been pounding, too, because I felt it high in my throat. And feeling that big, seagoing box of steel plates and bolts shuddering on my feet, painted sweat on my forehead and big, sticky splashes of real fear on my soul. This would be getting dead the hard way. But finally, the quivering of the ship came to a stop. 
calming down my own vibrations as it faded. Then the tub started to lift, giving me a new reason for keeping my mind off of taking a cut at Hallstaff with the closest fire axe. The crew got panicky as a bunch of kids in a burning school. And while they tumbled with the lifeboats, I took a last running look at number two holes. There were still bloodstains on the deck where I'd found Rhoda. And next to them, besides the open hatch, I'd found something that Hallstaff hadn't realized he'd lost or hadn't had time to look for. His pen, a pearl shell handle with an anchor on Boston silver. I pulled back the tops further, moved a few of the sectional hatch covers, and got a look into the hole. There was enough light to see the cargo, and enough smoke curled out to tell me the explosion had not been in the boilers. Yeah, I had a fine case, except it was going down under my feet, and I'd end up with everything but proof. It was shortly after dawn when the melee trader finally settled by the bow and went into a fine plunge. Everybody in the lifeboats turned and watched her go. The water quieted over her. And the only traces left were the hatch covers I'd pulled loose. Three, line 22. Ship's articles, you remember? Dollar. Oh, yes. But this newspaper, it says you're missing from shipwreck. Yeah. A guy would have to be stupid or dead to be lost on a sinking like that. Everything was too convenient. Plenty of time to get the boats launched. Only four miles from shore. The paper stated. Yeah, they reported me missing because I didn't take time to report myself among the living. You see, I couldn't wait to get back to Savannah, get back to you and... The king's size scheme cooked up in this office. Now, I'm not promising anything, but a quick signed statement might help you. I'll write it and you sign it. You talk about a scheme? What statement is this? Oh, come on, stop it. Look, use the old sex pitch. Try to sell me that it'll be worth my while, but, but don't try to sell me innocence. Mr. Darling, you think I know about something. Please. Tell me what it is. Look, if you're bluffing, you can quit. I know that explosion on the ship was staged. Now, the next step is to try to collect the insurance on the rubber that was lost. And that's the step I'm supposed to stop. Here. Here's my ID. You see, sorry. I not understand. You are a police? Yeah, in a way. In a way, I'm the police. And the real ones aren't far behind me. And you do not lie to me. Look, I wouldn't have any reason to. I knew nothing about it. I, too, do not lie. Well, why did you think your father was taking this trip? I did not question. Neil told me he had a business in Corpus Christi. Well, then Hallstaff lied here. The newspapers will tell you why your father took the trip. Here, look at this. Importer and fleet owner narrowly escapes death and explosion aboard his own ship. Now, who'd think of scuttling with the aged owner taking the risk himself, huh? Oh, darling, it's very difficult when in a few minutes... Two men you love become suddenly criminals. I am only daughter. I not question my father. If he did this thing, he did it with reason. Now, what did you have me to do? Well, first stop looking at me as if I started it all. I'm sorry. Honestly, I am. <laughs> clear to me now that she wasn't lying. And to hide my embarrassment, I read through the newspaper accounts of the sinking again while she recovered herself. There were air photographs of the huge oil slick the sinking ship had left on the surface, the only reminder now that the hatch covers had drifted away. The lack of wreckage was mentioned in the stories, and I remembered Al Rhoda worrying about ballast and displacement. I looked up the number of a local chemist, and I made a phone call.
Hello? Listen, Doc. This may sound like a silly question, but it could be important. Is crude rubber float? Crude rubber? Do you mean perhaps latex? Yeah, whatever you call it. The way it comes into the country, wrapped in the pan, will it float? Oh, specific gravity. Wait, I think. Uh, it decreases as the temperature rises. You see, normally, specific gravity is a little less than that of water. Yeah. It would float. Yeah, it floats. In the hold of a sunken ship, with a hatch partly open, it would force its way out and come to the surface? Yeah, it floats. Yeah, but it didn't. Thanks. Am I? Yes. How many warehouses does melee traders have here in Savannah? Only that Here on the waterfront, huh? Has anything moved out of last night, after the ship left? No, nothing was moved. Mr. Dollar, what does this mean? Am I? I want you to wait here in the office for your father. When he comes, I want you to tell him that I'll be waiting for him in one of the warehouses and that I know the truth. <laughs> Late trader warehouses were closed for the day, but my foot and a window opened them. Both were stacked high with imported goods, and I picked my way through everything from leachy nuts to ivory back scratches. In the second one, hidden behind a wall of carton Ceylon tea, I found what I was looking for. They were unlabeled wood crates. I opened one. And the resilient mass inside was crude rubber, still on dry land and still insured. All right, Dollar, hold it. Hold what, Holstaff? There's nothing left to hold. What do you mean by that? That for me, everything is finished, wound up. It's time for the law. Unless you can make another switch with that rubber before they get here. You mean that rubber on the crate? Yeah. Been here for over a year. Ah, oh, come on. Let's not waste time. You and Peeler and I know there wasn't any rubber in number two hole. You saved it to sell after you got paid off for losing it. But I'll let the experts prove it. What experts? Oh, they got all kinds. You know, one group is going to nail you for murder. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> That's very funny. So is a penknife a funny murder weapon. But I found one on the melee tape on the deck near number two hole. Got a pen, I Yeah. With a pearl handle and a silver anchor on it. You know, I guess at least a hundred seamen would testify under oath that it's yours. I know I will. I only wish I could be 15 people when you hit the courtroom. The jury, the prosecuting attorney, the star witness, and the sentencing judge. Well, you won't see me in a courtroom. How do they execute down here, huh? Gallows, electric chair, gas chamber, what? Come on, tell me. Or do I have to look it up? They'll have to have more than they've got. Uh-uh. They got plenty. All they have to do is match up the weapon with the wound. Look, Dollar, I don't scare easy. I could make a confession. And it still wouldn't hold without a body. What do you mean, without a body? They gotta have a body. Anyone knows that. You're getting ahead of yourself, Holstaff. Did I say they didn't have a body? Huh? Do you think those Coast Guard helicopter and blimp crews are blind? Keep going, Dollar. You think a guy who's been a Marine investigator as long as Al Ruta had went around without figuring how to do his job even after he was dead? What are you talking about? What do you think he wore around his middle? A money belt or a life belt that would keep him afloat? You're a stupid holster. Give me the knife, Dollar. It's not only a knife. It's Exhibit A. And the prosecution will want it. Give me the knife, Dollar. I'll kill you if I have to. You don't want to shoot me, Holstaff. How do you know I've got the knife with me? Huh? How do you know I haven't left it someplace with a note to the police? Stand still. Now get your hands off to the side. Now hold on there. All right, now keep your hands still. Now just turn around. Don't move. It wasn't time for Queensbury rules. It was close to me, and I used my feet. The first one landed on his shin. And the same movement, I fell forward on my hands and kicked out with big hands. 
two sea boots into the solar plexus would have stopped an ordinary man. And after I gave him a couple more... Uh, uh, the big chief mate uh, turned into just that. Uh, an ordinary man. I turned Hallstaff over to the police along with the murder weapon and the results of my bluff. They took it from there to a confession. Mr. Peeler was cleared of responsibility for Al Roder's murder, but was now being held on conspiracy to the floor. I hope since the policy on the remaining cargo of rubber can now be canceled, Intercontinental is minimizing the monetary loss in Singapore. To you, the loss is a little more than $100,000 and an operative. I have lost a friend. Expense account item two, $63. Getting my foot on a bar and my chin off the chest while waiting for a train to take me out of Savannah. Item three, $80. Transportation Savannah to Huff. Item four, $10. Public stenographer who took the dictation on this expense account. Item five, entertainment. Same public stenographer who spent the evening proving that socially she didn't take dictation. Also that she was no good at making me forget what I want so badly to forget. The face of our Rhoda. Expense account total? Ah, uh, skip it. This one is on me. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd with music by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen starring in Harry M. Popkins' United Artists production, D.O.A. Featured in our cast were Lillian Byer, Barton Yarborough, William Conrad, Elliot Reed, and Robert Griffin. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us again next week when Edmund O'Brien returns in another adventure of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The Case of the Oblivious Angels. A true story of manhunt in Tennessee and Georgia is to be dramatized on Gangbusters this Saturday night. The story will have narration by the chief of police who directed the successful search for the bandits. So for a half hour of real adventure, as experienced by our forces combating crime, listen in this Saturday on most of these same CBS network stations to Gangbusters' story, The Case of the Oblivious Angels. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, meets adventure every Friday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System.